Welcome back to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. My name is Christopher Brown, as always, and today is our second day of Oil and Gas Week here on the show. As I said yesterday, we're sitting down with the frontline workers of the oil and gas industry to talk to them about the oil and gas industry, but what they're hearing and what they're seeing. Uh, today, we have Peter Galliardi on the show. Uh, he has been in the oil and gas industry for nine years. He is with Shell. Peter, thank you so much for doing this. It's an honor and a pleasure. Uh, thanks, Chris. Great to be here. Uh, so, Peter, I've got to ask the first question because uh, I asked this to the first uh, guest that I had on this week. But what does the oil and gas industry mean to you? What does it mean to me? So, um, so I think of it as, as an industry to provide energy. Um, which is which is something really really important for people, and you know has been for a long time. You know it's been evolving through time, um, and and kind of the current flavor of of uh, energy is oil and gas, um, which you know as as you see from the world around us is is changing. You know it's it's a it's an ever changing narrative as as I think it should be, um, but uh, but yeah that's kind of what the industry means to me. And then as a as an Albertan as a Calgarian. Um, it, it means a lot more than that because it is, you know, kind of how this province, how this city got built up to be such, such an amazing province and city. Um, and, and, you know, I've lived in Calgary my whole life and I know that the oil and gas industry had a big factor in making it the city it is today, the city that I love so much. So was it always a plan for you to get into the oil and gas uh, industry or was it a sort of, did you fall into it? How, how did you get into involved in the oil and gas industry? Yeah, I, uh, I definitely would say I fell into it. So it was, it was not always my plan. Um, I, I don't know that I really had huge career aspirations, you know, growing up. I mean, when I was little, I wanted to be an astronaut and uh, probably, you know, as I got older, it morphed into, you know, like a scientist, maybe, maybe a professor or a teacher. And um, just, you know, I went into school as a physics major um, that evolved into a geophysics major. Um, uh, and, uh, and I ended up landing in the oil and oil and gas industry uh, because of that. Now, what do you do in the oil and gas industry, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, so um, if you don't mind me answering, because it's it's kind of been a whirlwind adventure for me um, over the last nine years at Shell, I, I started doing something very theoretical, very kind of back end um, called uh, seismic processing. So it's it's uh, it's something you could you know honestly you go to university and you do this sort of stuff. It's that theoretical um, with with a bit of the application side, but that evolved into something called geohazards analysis, which is, which is you know, when you're drilling a well, um, you, you kind of, you're going in blind, you know, unless you do, you do the right research and, and you, you look at some data of wells around you and, and some other types of data. So I did that for a bit. And um, most recently I've, I've moved into data science and uh, kind of business intelligence. And I've also done well, well pad planning so so that's that's something else that i snuck in there too so as anyone who's listened to the uh, well as yesterday's episode you will know that i am not a scientist so i'm gonna play <laughs> the the listener here and i'm gonna ask yep. you the stupid questions that you're gonna go why are you asking me this but for my listeners and for myself to better educate myself please do what, what? <laughs> <laughs> you, you just said some big words there about what your job is. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm looking at you and going, wait, there's more than just the people who are on the front lines who are building the pipes and there's people behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. So there's a lot to pick apart there. Um, <laughs> there is. I, and I, I do apologize for that, but this is what the okay. show's about. We're trying to learn. <laughs> it's okay. And, and I mean, honestly, when I think back to what I just told you, I, there, there are a lot of words in there that, that just are natural day to day in oil and gas. Actually, not even, that's not even true. Uh, they're day to day in some parts of the, of the business. Right. But um, let's, let's see, probably the, the thing most near and dear to my heart is the geohazards part. Okay. So, so I'll, I'll start there. I'll pick that apart a little bit um, and stop me if, if I get into too much detail or you oh, want to I switch will. to something. Okay, thanks. <laughs> oh, I'll, so, I'll stop you if I don't understand or if I have a question about it. So go oh, ahead. Of course. Yes, yes. Questions anytime. Clarifications anytime. So, so um, yeah, like I said, when you're, when you're going to drill a well, um, you, you, you're kind of like sticking this hole in the ground. You're drilling um, kilometers deep. And, and so 
you, you got to have some way of knowing what you're going to be up against. And I, the analogy I always use is ultrasounds. So, so when you are, when you're trying to look at a baby or, or something else inside your body, you can't just like go in there and poke around um, because that's damaging and, and it's, it's just not a good way to do it. So you do this thing called ultrasound. Um, and, and actually in, in the oil and gas industry, there's this thing called seismic imaging, which is like exactly the same, but at a big scale. Um, and so when we're talking geohazards, we're saying, okay, you could be drilling, drilling a well to a particular target um, that's, you know, two kilometers deep, but it's possible in the first two kilometers before you hit your target, there's going to be like a shallow pocket of, of gas. So, so just you'll, you'll accidentally hit some rock that lets some natural gas flow out unexpectedly. And at the, on the drilling rig, what'll happen is you know, the, this gas, this gas will start to come out suddenly. Um, it could potentially spark. It could potentially cause a fire. It could potentially burn the rig down. People could get hurt, that sort of thing. And so, um, you know, that's one example uh, that's, that's kind of, um, you know. So what elaborate. your job is, is to basically ensure safety at the end of the day, is to basically look at an area, try to figure out where is the best optical optimal spot to potentially put a new well in this area correct and am i that, hearing you correctly here that's that's right and 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 you know is it safe is there is there some way we have to design or do the drilling to make sure we do it safely like like is there is there some weird twist that we have to plan for or some you know some extra situation we have to plan for yep so that, that was that was one of the things i did yep Okay. Yeah. And now you now currently, and you said data science, data science. Yep. So I, I can pick that one apart. Yeah. Yeah. Let's pick that one apart because that's what you do now. And let's talk about that because that's the one that we'll stick with a little bit because that's where you're, we'll go back to the uh, uh, geohazard a little bit later, but right now let's stick with what you do because I want people to know who you are before we get into the sort of the nitty gritty part of the interview. Yeah, sounds good. So data science, simply it's, you know, all this, this AI and machine learning that you hear about. So data science is, is kind of that field. And, you know, particularly in oil and gas, we, we, we have a lot of data these days, but it's not, it's not as much data as you would get like on Facebook or on Google. So, you know, those, those places are you know, billions of data points. Um, you can kind of let statistics run their course when you're doing things like machine learning and AI, they can really rely on statistics. But when you get into the oil and gas industry, we have a lot of data that, that we can't really just process it mentally ourselves. So we need some assistance, some help from, from AI and machine learning, but we can't purely rely on statistics. We have to blend it with our knowledge of the science of what's going on and, and kind of the operations and, and how those all work together. And, and so what I've been trying to break into lately at, at Shell has been th this data science world of how can I, how can I take this giant volume of data that people, people are gathering and blend it with my knowledge of the science of what's going on and, and kind of the business impacts, like what, what do you do that actually changes the business that, that gets you more money or loses you money, those sorts of things. How do I blend all that together? Um, so that's, that's kind of what I've, what I've been trying to, to do in the last couple of years. Is and why is that, that important? Why is that important? Because you talk about the financial aspect. You talk about uh, what's going to make us money, what's going to lose us money. But why would businesses look need that information? Because I understand financial businesses are all about money. And I, I, I'm a business owner myself. I'm about mm -hmm. money. But there has mm -hmm. to be a little bit more about what you're doing to than just dollars and cents. Yeah, I mean, it's so for me, one of the big, the big impacts I look for in my work is, is how do I help, you know, other staff do their day-to-day -day work better and, and, um, and, you know, make better decisions and just, just make life a little bit easier for them. It, it's been, it's been a tough few years in the industry and, and uh, every, every company has their own story of layoffs and, and restructuring and all of that. Um, Shell by its nature, it's, it's a big international company. So it has to do things very uh, methodically step-by-step. Step. And so it's been, it's been quite a few years of cut after cut after cut. And it seems like, you know, you, you're kind of just going from one to the next. And um, in, in many cases, the amount of work people have to do hasn't really gone down 
to match the, the staff reduction. So people are working longer hours and, and, and they're getting tired and they're getting stressed out. And, and so one of the personal impacts I look for is how can I help people get a bit of their work-life balance back? And, you know, it, it does make its way into into day-to-day -day decisions as well. So not just, you know, that I want people not to be stressed, but the stress that they carry will actually make their decision, you know, a little poorer. And, and, uh, and, and so it's kind of a double-edged sword there. So that's, that's kind of my personal, more of a personal connection to why I do what I do. And I appreciate that because that's what this show's about is put a face to, uh, put a face to the industry that we seem to have an issue with on social media, which I, I still find quite ironic, but mm -hmm. I want to talk about that right now because you mentioned it briefly, but I'm not sure if you mentioned it, it because of COVID-19 or because of the environmental aspect of the oil and gas industry. Over the last few years, we have seen a rise, actually, I wouldn't say the last few years, but the last decade, probably even two decades, we have seen a rise in environmental concerns around the oil and gas industry. Uh, is there going to be spillage? Is there going to be this, that, or other? We're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about your industry's perception from your pers uh, perspective from you mm -hmm. and this is mm -hmm. not shell this is peter talking right now mm -hmm. that's right yeah how have you seen like what do you take away when you hear the negative tones that come from social media and the news the media that like the talking heads on media when they talk about the oil and gas industry and how it's quote unquote destroying the world Right. So I, yeah, the, there's a, I talk about this a lot and, and I apologize. I, I'm kind of, I have a very cynical worldview these days. Um, I think we all though, do after COVID. <laughs> yes. Though, though, to be honest, watching your podcast through this last municipal election has helped that because I, I feel that there were quite a few candidates that you interviewed that, that seemed to have kind of a good head on their shoulders and made me feel better about, about at least our local politics, but I digress. So, um, so what do I think? I, I just feel like in general, you know, social media and, and kind of the voices on the internet are becoming more and more polarized and almost like an echo chamber of, you know, if, if you're on one side of an argument, you, you find a whole bunch of other people that agree with you and you just kind of, you just milk that side of the argument. And then the other side does the same thing. And you end up with kind of two very strong viewpoints that oppose each other, but they can't really find good ways, constructive ways to talk in the middle. And so I, I feel like as a society, social media is kind of making us lose the ability to have a proper debate and a proper argument. Um, and, and I, because I personally think it's important to have some of that environmental opposition because we, you know, if you let a business run its course, you know, without any sort of uh, opposition, it's just going to milk what's going to make the most money. And, you know, particularly working at a place like Shell, you realize that, you know, if reputation is and social responsibility is part of a company's value proposition, then they will listen to the, the opposition and they will try and find compromises and they will try and get better at, at those sorts of things. So, so I think it's important to have that opposition and, and have that voice there. I just think that on both sides, it's become too polarized uh, and uh, on social media media particularly where you know that the opposition voices are kind of just black and white you're pure evil you must completely stop what you're doing and and you know some people on on the oil and gas side saying we, we you know just shouldn't worry about those voices at all and, and just do what we've been doing all these years and you know I think I think we need to find better ways to have the dialogue and I appreciate you saying that because if anyone's listened to the show, you know, I hate social media. I have to do it because of the show. You get listeners mm -hmm. that way. Mm -hmm. But like you said, you are in two camps. If you're on social media, you're on the right or the wrong side or the wrong side and the right side, depending mm -hmm. on which issue you take. And there's no winning. There's no winning at all. Um, I don't want to put words in your mouth here. So and I don't want you to put words in your mouth for your colleagues. But right. what is the general consensus at uh, with your fellow colleagues about what you're hearing on social media, because I would get frustrated hearing mm -hmm. time and time again that the oil and gas sector is dead. Our current mayor of Calgary, this is airing in December, had her first priority 
she said, because this is being uh, recorded the day she is being sworn in, Mm -hmm. she said that her first priority was to transition away from oil and gas and move to uh, declare an environmental crisis. Mm -hmm. When you hear stuff like that from politicians, not only here in Calgary, but from the federal leaders as well, even provincial leaders, does that take wind out of your sail and say, like, how do we continue on when we have so many levels of government attacking us? Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it, it kind of does. Um, it, it does take the wind out of my sails a bit. But uh, like, on the other hand, there's a lot of stuff that I find governments do and say that, you know, they're, they really, I don't know, they, they really want to take sometimes an extreme point of view to appeal to a certain group of voters or, you know, certain lobby groups or whoever. And so, you know, for example, I know, I know that declaring an environmental crisis, there's, there's actually an opportunity to get some funding by, by doing that. So I know there's maybe a little bit more than just kind of spouting that term out there. And there's, there's maybe a bit of a practical reason to do it. So, so I'm not as, I'm not as up in arms as I think some other people might be. Um, But on the other hand, the the word you use there that I think is important people forget about is transition. So, so we, we can't just stop what we're doing in oil and gas and, and expect some other solution to pick everything up right away. We have to transition, which means we're going to have to live with oil and gas until we start getting momentum somewhere else. And, and I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And, and I think, you know, in terms of, of my workplace and my colleagues, I, you know, I think I would say a lot of them probably echo the same sorts of sentiments that they they believe that a transition is needed we need to start moving away from oil and gas into other types of energy but we need to actually figure out how to make these other types of energy economic build some momentum in them build some infrastructure around them and it, you know it's it's kind of happening slowly but but we have to we have to respect that this is this is a big this is a big thing it's like oil and gas has been around for a long time and has been a critical part of of how we run our society and and so to expect that to change overnight is is impossible um and so we have to kind of we have to have again that dialogue of you know, pressure to change, but not so much pressure that it totally demoralizes people currently working in that sector. I I don't know. I, I want to say this and I want to say this correctly. So I do apologize if I if this comes across incorrectly. Okay. I'm shocked right now. Mm-hmm. You are a very pragmatic guy. Oh, thanks. I I went into this series of shows, and this is my second interview I've done with the oil and gas industry. So there's still more to come, mm-hmm. but you, there's a perception around the oil and gas sector where the workers there are very, hey, we're oil, and oil is going to be the best thing. But you're talking about transition. You're talking about moving away from oil and gas. You're talking about like hazards, like. Mm-hmm. Where is this part of the story when the media talks about the oil and gas sector? Because I'm like, we've only been talking for almost 20 minutes and I feel like the oil and gas sector has gotten a bad rap over the last decade because the perception is you guys are destroying the planet. Mm -hmm. Well, so (laughs) yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for that. I'm glad I I, I come across as pragmatic. I I hope I am. I I try and be balanced in in my worldviews. I think a couple of points I want to say to that. First of all, the media, media is like, it's being pragmatic is not sexy to the media. You know, That's the true. media, the media needs conflict to be entertaining. And, and, and it's a discussion I have all the time that, that, you know, news channels and, and news outlets, they become entertainment and really focused on that, that, and it's not, it's not just about laying out facts or, or explaining what's going on in the world. They have to grab a, a viewer, which means that they have to be entertaining. And, and so that's created a bit of a conundrum where, you know, if you look at, at really almost any media these days, it's got to be extreme one way or, or the other to attract attention. And, and you often don't get a balanced, pragmatic worldview. You know, there's still, there's still some, some places where you can get that, or you kind of have to do it yourself sometimes by f- looking at multiple sources to get, get a full story. Um, yeah, so, so that's, that's one I, thing I'll say. Yeah. I'm just, I'm shocked. I'm honestly shocked right now. I, <laughs> I, I I was expecting this this week of series shows to go one way and it's completely just upended my whole idea of the oil and gas industry. So I appreciate, uh, Peter, for you doing this again. Um, I want to talk about the good 
because we talk about the bad perception that the oil and gas sector has, and we need to not have that perception, but... Journalism is in crisis, and our mission here at the Cross Border Interview Podcast is to tell the story that isn't being told. It is vital that independent journalism survives with the rise of fake news. Every penny that is contributed to the Cross Border Interview Podcast goes to help continue our work to tell people's stories. All of our content is produced and edited by our team. The Cross Border Interview Podcast provides entirely free content, and we will never hide stories behind paywalls. By supporting a new model of journalism, our listeners, like you, are supporting real, independent journalism. Consider making a monthly donation via our Patreon account, or make a one-time donation by Interact eTransfer. Now, let's get back to the show we our economy is still tied to that oil and gas sector we are still tied and it is still going to be tied for years to come as much as some people want us to transition tomorrow Mm -hmm. it ain't gonna happen i think if anyone who says that they're lying to themselves Mm -hmm. what from your perspective what what's the untold stories that we need to be talking about in the oil and gas sector? Because uh, you're a da- data guy, you have the data. You you talk about you talk the data. So mm-hmm. what is the data? What is the stories that we should be looking at moving forward? Because this is coming to 2021 is coming to a close. We're looking at a fresh new year. What are the stories that we should be looking at? Yeah. So so I think I think one of the stories that especially Albertans, you know, end up looking at is, is what are the effects of having, you know, some big resource industry uh, in your backyard that that is able to kind of share benefits with other industries. So, you know, a, a thriving oil and gas industry also means, you know, there's, there's people have more money to spend on dining out or on entertainment or, you know, those sorts of things. And, and so it, you know, having, a thriving industry of some kind will will reap benefits for all other industries in in your in your province. Maybe not all other industries, but many other industries um, in your in your area. So I think that that's one thing. But but also so you think going back to this, understand that uh, sometimes some some people do, some people don't. But yeah, it's it's hard to. I'm a big picture guy, so I I get I, I have a hard time when I get into nitty gritty about things. But when I th- I, I love thinking about, you know, big picture, like how does one thing impact another, impact another, impact another. And so, you know, when we talk about decarbonization or when we talk about the effects of the oil and gas industry, I, I think big picture and, you know, oil and gas industry, I think you have a good oil and gas industry. That means people have more money to spend on other consumer goods, on, on, on other types of things. And that, that helps other people get jobs, other industries do well. And I also think, so this is slightly off topic from your question, but it's it's kind of where I come from a data side. When we talk about decarbonization, um, the the arguments I, I often see about you know reducing activity in oil and gas, you know, in Canada or reducing emissions in Canada that way, what I think they often fail to do is look at the full chain of, of events. So what I don't want to happen is that we we move it out of our backyard, but it goes into somebody else's backyard. And, and many people will argue, hey, like, why, why shouldn't we have oil sands in Alberta rather than getting oil from Saudi Arabia or something like that? Because they'll, they'll say, we're more responsible here than they are there. And, and I would one up that and say, it can even be equivalent. Like, what is the point of reducing emissions in Canada if you pick them up anywhere else, responsible or not? It's still the same emissions. This is this is not a local problem. This is a global problem. And so where I come from the data perspective is I'd like to see more work done to, to look at the full global chain of, of emissions. And I know for a fact that is difficult. There's, there's a lot to pull apart there. Um, but, but even I think making more of an effort will allow people to see how interconnected things are and try and tackle this from a more global perspective. Do you feel supported in the oil and gas industry here in Alberta? In, in Alberta, I, I would say I, I do feel relatively well supported, you know, locally, I, I think, you know, friends and family and, you know, people I would, I would meet 
on the street, which doesn't happen very often these days because of COVID restrictions, but you know, still my neighbors and, and whoever. Um, I feel like most people are, are understanding and like, I, I don't feel like I need to hide this from anybody I talk to in the city. Um, so, so I do feel well supported locally from that, from that end. Once again, you know, the, I think some opposition is healthy and, you know, having an argument with somebody about it um, is different than somebody just cutting me off and not, not wanting to talk to me at all. And, and I have not found that so far in my experience. People are always willing to talk and, and be, you know, relatively friendly in, in, you know, our local area. So definitely in Calgary, probably in Alberta. We, uh, we as Albertans, and I say that uh, using the royal we because I, I, I'm from Ontario. I moved here a few years ago, so I'm relatively new, but I consider myself a Calgarian and an Albertan. I have the driver's license to prove it, even though I can't drive because of my eye, but here we are. Yep. I believe there is... I, want to use, I, want, I don't want to paint a broad stroke here, but I'm going to, and I apologize to my Ontario, Quebec, and Manitoba and Saskatchewan <laughs> listeners. If you want to send negative feedback, please send it to the contact form on the website. We'll be filed away appropriately. Um, I feel like Alberta gets a bad rap, and I want you to talk to the people in Ontario and Quebec right now and tell them why what you do is important. Because I think the message doesn't get out. I think we have the politicians infighting. I think we have the politicians attacking each other. And we don't hear from the frontline people who actually make a difference in our society each day by doing what they do to ensure that the environment is protected, like you said, uh, to ensure that what we're doing is correct. And I want you to take a moment and talk to the people and tell them why what you do is important and why the oil and gas industry is needed, particularly at this time of day. Ooh, yeah, that's that's a big one. So, so I, I, think, I always leave the big one for the last few minutes of the show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I think you know if if you think about day to day. So, yeah, this goes for everybody across Canada. Day to day some of the things you do, like, like if you go to a grocery store and you buy produce that, that is not from your hometown, like, you know, hands up if you buy produce that was not grown locally in your hometown, right? Um, where does it come from? You, yeah. <laughs> where, where does it come from? Ontario. Yeah. And how does it get here? Yeah. You know, and, 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 you know, it's great. It's great to think about electric, electric vehicles, you know, for example, but, but wait a minute, how do electric vehicles get charged? You have to generate electricity. How do you generate electricity? Okay, some places have hydro, some places, you know, you know, have wind or, or, you know, are able to have solar and okay, that's all good, but not everybody can get there yet. So just switching to electric power does not solve the problem. Then there's the, you know, the, the problem of actually mining the materials you need to make the battery for the car. So, so Again, it's not a simple, there are no simple solutions anymore. We've got to work together on this. So I think the heart of my message is let's, let's work together. I think the industry has gotten a bad rap at least in part because it was it did have problems with responsibility in the past and it and it has done things that are not not great um, you know from a, a responsibility perspective and it and it is you know emitting carbon into the atmosphere that is that is contributing to greenhouse effects and going to contribute it's contributing to climate change and and yes this this is all happening but but let's figure out what to do moving forward so we're certainly not going to move forward by fighting you know, mistakes and, and hate with more hate and more mistakes. We've got to find ways to band together and, and come, at, come at this as a group. And I think if we can use the successes and all of the things we learn, all of the technology improvements we make from oil and gas, and we can start to leverage them in other industries, we can start to apply some of the, some of the richness, you know, across the country to apply these to other efforts. I think I think that's that's where we should be going because the fact is if you stop and really think about where oil and gas impacts your life it it's just so far reaching it's become so pervasive um uh, you know i for example saw a protest of a of an oil rig one one time visiting seattle and the people who were protesting were doing so in plastic canoes and it's you know it's it's like well how did you get the plastic for those canoes you know how did you get here for the protest 
you know, frankly, right? So, so I think the truth is we all use it to some extent. We all contribute to, to the climate change, to the, you know, the, the carbon emissions to some extent. And, and so we can each find little ways to make it better in our own, in our own personal lives. Um, and, and we should be trying to fight to help people find more and more ways to do this rather than trying to you know, block an industry. We should be trying to use that industry to fund other industries that, that, that will be better. And again, thinking about this as a transition, I totally agree. It'll need to come down and we'll need to find other solutions, but we have to, we have to work together on it and, and find it because they're not, there are no easy solutions anymore. And yelling into the void of social media is not helping anyone. <laughs> No, no, it, it just never does. No, it just you, you go does. ahead if you want. If you want to spend 12 hours of your life yelling on Twitter, go right ahead. I have other things that I have to do. Um, I want to talk about 2022. As I said, this is coming to a close. Mm -hmm. What outlook do you give the oil and gas industry in 2022? We talked about uh, perception. We talked about that, but uh, you see the numbers every day. Does it look good? Because we have... Uh, let's be honest, a boom and bust cycle in the oil and gas uh, industry. Sure and do. Uh, we are, it looks, I saw numbers out yesterday or today, if I'm not mistaken, that it looks like we're on the rebound. Do mm -hmm. you have hope for the oil and gas sector in 2022? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of do. Uh, and this is another double-edged sword. Like you said, oil and gas is, is a boom and bust type of industry. And, and I do think I, you know, I'm seeing good signs. We're we're improving. We're we're hitting back to more of the boom over the bust mentality, and a lot of that is driven by demand because people are still using it, right? But what what worries me about that is once we if we do get back into a boom cycle, then you know people kind of forget about all of the things we've been learning over the bust and and kind of I, I don't know just just flipping too far again the other way and and you know letting things go out of control again and then you know inevitably we'll end up with another bust right and and so on my you know on a personal level I'm I'm just gonna plan for that it'll be hopefully nice to get out of a bust because I feel like pretty much my entire career so far has been either, you know, in a bust or almost in a bust. And, and, you know, I've, I've got, I'm almost in the double digits with number of layoff rounds I've survived. Um, so it'll be nice to, to kind of just be able to work, work for a while. Um, but I do, I do worry that, you know, all of, all of this good stuff we're trying to do about climate change and, and, and responsibility is, is going to start to get forgotten once, once the boom starts again. Um, and, and so, you know, my message would be hold fast and, and you know, keep looking for those efficiencies and, and keep looking for ways to decarbonize, even, even though we're probably entering a place where we're going to, you know, oil and gas is going to be making good money again. Um, and, and this is not the end of the story either. You know, this, this is not, I, I can think of some people who might, who might take it as like a hero's triumph that the oil and gas industry is booming again because the price went up and, and some who may claim it's, you know, it's, it's their, uh, responsibility that that they they somehow impacted the price all by themselves or you know that sort of thing but but it's it's not going to last forever and we need to make the most of the boom when it does come i appreciate that because i think a lot of people don't understand the boom and bust cycle but hearing it from someone in the industry is always better to hear it than some person who thinks they know everything on twitter or social media yep. um peter i want to thank you um this has been an honor and a pleasure uh i feel like we just scratched the surface but we have five days of this and we have mm -hmm. certain people coming in to talk about certain aspects of the oil and gas sector and to hear from a data guy about some of the numbers some of the things that you've done that you do that the oil and gas sector has done and will do has been is, is eye-opening and like i said during the interview i think it was about 10 minutes into it we have pragmatic people in the industry of the oil and gas sector and it's not the and i hate to use this word but the your traditional grandfather's oil and gas industry anymore it is people who mm. are doing it for right reasons and are looking after not just the oil and gas sector but the environmental sector as well so thank you 
No, thank you. I, I really appreciate the chance to talk. And, and yeah, I, I hope the rest of your guests are, are equally, you know, uh, interesting and that you're, you're learning lots throughout this week, because yeah, just like any, any industry, there is diversity within the industry. And, and you, you know, as humans, we always like to paint with as broad of a stroke as we can. But the truth is, there's just so much diversity, no matter where you go. And, and I've learned to appreciate that, especially working at an international company like Shell, there's just so much diversity in here. Um, and I know the industry as a whole is filled with the diversity. And, you know, so honestly, so is every other industry these days, like, we are a more and more a global society with, you know, people who are more and more free to speak their own voice. And, and so I just thank you so much, Chris, for having, having this week and allowing this diversity to shine through. Exactly. Um, thank you so much, Peter, uh, for everyone listening. We will be back tomorrow morning, which is Wednesday to talk about, talk with another guest for the oil and gas uh, week. Um, if you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button on YouTube. If you're listening to this on the audio versions, hit the subscribe button on Spotify, Apple Podcast, wherever you're listening to this. But also, if you want to back the show, head over to Patreon and give a monthly donation of even $3 a month that helps us continue the show and get uh, sort of a, a neutral conversation going about the issues that are facing this world. So thank you so much, Peter, for doing this. Uh, to my listeners, have yourself an excellent rest of your Tuesday and keep talking. Just talk and get off social media for a day. Uh, thanks so much, guys. Have yourself an excellent day.